I don't know why love isn't talked <laughs> as much about in business. It probably harkens back to, you know, the, the mechanistic way we've kind of been brought up to think about business and in terms of leverage and efficiency. And we have very kind of operational me mechanistic ways of thinking. Go back to Frederick Taylor working with Henry Ford. You know, it's really this cogs, uh, kind of cog based way of thinking about business. And in, in those ways and frameworks, you know, I think love is, and lots of emotions are really thought about as somewhat messy and somewhat inefficient. But, but what happens when we take that sort of emotion out of business is we take out uh, a real ability to connect and inspire um, and support uh, a variety of human beings. This is the ERP Organizational Change Journal podcast, brought to you by Nestle & Associates, a Newport Beach, California-based ERP organizational change management firm serving the private equity industry. The ERP OCJ seeks to share expertise, insight, experience, and research, and to create effective conversation to help guide ERP organizational change to real, measurable, and verified success. And now, here's your ERP expert and host, the founder of Nestle & Associates, Dr. Jack Nessel. Hey everyone, welcome to the ERP OCJ podcast. I'm your host, Jack Nessel, and on this episode, we're headed into a great discussion with Doug Sunheim. So let's get to it. Doug is president of the Sunheim Group, which advises and coaches CEOs, senior leaders, and teams. Doug is also author of Taking Smart Risk and a Harvard Business Review and Forbes contributor, a frequent speaker on a variety of business topics, including leadership, organizational culture, and strategy. He has delivered talks at Columbia University, New York University, the Society for Human Resources, and the World Research Group Conference. In 2005, Doug co-authored the 25 Best Time Management Tools and Techniques, which has been translated into five languages and continues to be a bestseller. This episode will further examine insights from Doug's book, including taking smart risk, rewarding for failure, general tactics and practice to encourage smart risk taking, and pointers on how to act fast and learn fast. We're so happy to have Doug join us today to share his book, his experience, and his work. Joining us from New York, New York, Doug, welcome to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Well, thank you. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so first, Doug, please tell us more. Uh, introduce yourself to our listeners, please. Sure. Uh, so uh, as you said, Doug Sundheim, I've uh, been doing organizational consulting, leadership coaching, team coaching for about 20 years now. Uh, was in the ad industry and consulting industry before that. Often the question I get is, how did you get, how did you jump ship into doing the stuff on your own? I did it at a pretty young age in my uh, late twenties and uh, was part of uh, was part of something back in the dot-com era called a poof IPO, which didn't exist before the dot-com era. And I'm not sure it exists afterwards, but there's about an eight month period where people thought it was a pretty good idea to find a bunch of operating companies, merge them and take them public on the same day. And I watched uh, a bunch of people, really smart people make some operationally, let's say questionable decisions uh, and I watched uh, a firm that I had some uh, fair amount of options in uh, go public for a billion dollars and have its assets sold in bankruptcy court for $3 million just a couple years later. And I got fascinated with leadership and organizational dynamics, went back to Columbia, got a degree in organization and leadership. And uh, probably when I was too young and too stupid to realize it was a bad idea, <laughs> I hung out my own shingle and uh, started organizational consulting and faked it till I made it. And it's now 20 years later. And, you know, my, my primary focus now is really senior teams uh, and senior executives and helping them really kind of improve their uh, ways of engaging each other, running the business and operating together as, as a group and a team. Very interesting experience. You know, I guess it sounds like you've went through, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, trial by fire yep. on the job training, so to speak, right? And that kind of inspired your interest in terms of leadership and some of the topics that we're going to discuss today. It's really rooted in some pretty profound experience, it sounds like, that you've had early on in your career. Yeah, it really did. You know, it's interesting. The, the, the business I'm in, which could loosely be called, you know, executive and team coaching, but people come at it from a lot of different places. And, you know, a lot of people come at it from the HR side of stuff, the real people side of stuff. And I, I came at it from the entrepreneurial side of things. 
Um, so I think it, it really lends itself to my specific t type of consulting, which is roll up the sleeves, get in there, figure out what's going on, and really look at the holistic sure. business. So it's just kind of a different perspective, one that you know, I think my clients have found pretty valuable. Sure. Well, yeah, hey, let's. Uh, I agree. So let's go ahead and share some of that perspective with our listeners. I'm really looking forward to this. But Doug, before we get to your book, which is obviously the title of this episode, I'd like to ask you to share a couple of posts because you discussed some interesting points, but they are actually still ideas still discussed in your book. But you wrote an article from HBR titled, When Crisis Strikes Lead with Humanity, and that was an April 24th, 2020 article. And for our listeners, we will include the reference in our show notes. But Doug, you state that, quote, balancing this tension requires leaders to lead with humanity and to do a few important things, which includes, quote, put people first, quote, be upfront and vulnerable, and quote, support and connect. What should leaders be vulnerable to? Uh, isn't that a leadership weakness? And what can you share with our listeners on that point? Yeah, I think um, vulnerability is something that we all have, right? There are things that I'm not good at, you're not good at, there are mistakes that you make that I make. And the important thing for leaders to really understand, I believe, is that everyone can smell that, right? Everyone can kind of sense when a leader's in over their head or when a leader's made a mistake. And especially this day and age where business is changing, as you well know, faster than ever, the complexity of business, the business model changes, the technology is changing, everything is moving so quick that to really come across as knowing it all or having it all together all the time, just it's disingenuous. It smells of inauthenticity. Yeah. And so, you know, what I often say to my leaders, my, my, my clients is acknowledge that stuff. That's how you get your power back, right? Just acknowledge and, and people see it as genuine and they see you as a human being. Uh, and you have an ability to engage then and really find you know, a path forward uh, in the moment. If, if you're trying too much to hide those weaknesses, you just lose your ability to really connect with people. So it, that's kind of the best way, I think, to think about it. Yeah, so true. That, that's well said. The next article, Doug, and again, this is an HBR article, uh, Harvard Business Review, was called We Need Leaders Who Have the Courage to Love. And that was from November 18, 2020. And I have to admit, I, I actually, while well, I enjoyed this article, but you don't often hear love, quote unquote, come up much in leadership literature. But you state that, quote, while we don't yet know the best path forward to address these challenges, I do know where the paths start with love, end quote. In fact, Doug, you also state on your website that one of your core principles is to, quote, you need to hold people's feet to the fire, do it with compassion, do it with love, do it with respect but don't let people off the hook, including yourself, end quote. Can you tell us more? Can you share more on that idea around love and, and how you can use that to manage and to be a good leader? Yeah, I think that love is really a connection with human beings. And, you know, I once heard there's a, a gentleman that's in education with him, Parker Palmer. He's a big name in uh, education circles. And he had this great set of concepts that listening is love. One of the greatest acts of love we can give to another person is genuinely listen to them. And uh, so I don't know why love isn't talked <laughs> as much about in business. It probably harkens back to, you know, the, the mechanistic way we've kind of been brought up to think about business in, in terms yeah. of leverage and efficiency. And we have very kind of operational me mechanistic ways of thinking. Go back to Frederick Taylor working with Henry Ford. You know, it's really this cogs, uh, kind of cog based way of thinking about business. And in, in those ways and frameworks, you know, I think love is, and lots of emotions are really thought about as somewhat messy and somewhat inefficient. But, but what happens when we take that sort of emotion out of business is we take out a real ability to connect and inspire and support a, a variety of human beings, <laughs> whether mm -hmm. it's our customers or our, or our employees uh, or our suppliers or anyone in the business. And it kind of, it's very similar to that vulnerability point where people can sense if you're not connecting with them. You know, love on its own is a great quote. It's in that article actually by, uh, by Martin Luther King, which is power without love is reckless and abusive, but mm -hmm. love without power is anemic and sentimental. Nice. Like 
Yeah, and, I like that. You know, it's a real balance and a real tension because you, you can see if, if you just walk around saying, well, I love you, I love you, I love you, <laughs> you know, you're not going to get anywhere in business. That's yeah. obvious. But if you're yeah. walking around with this kind of power mentality, autocratic mentality, and not really connecting with people, you're not going to go that far either. So I think the most probably effective way to think about it is this real balance. And I, I think that last point, you know, anemic and sentimental, there's another quote in that article, which I've always loved, which was, um, love takes off masks that we're afraid are going to, that are hiding something from us that we really need to let out there in the open. And then that is really a daring and a risky and a courageous thing to do. So whereas sometimes people think about love as a soft, sort of concept, really, the ability to really love and connect with people, it's one of the riskiest things you can do in business. And you yeah. know, in my experience working with leaders, it really pays off if you're able to do it in a genuine way. So a lot of power, as long as it's not just floating out there in a sentimental and anemic way. Yeah, man, very well said, Doug. You know, at the end of the day, you know, there's technology and then you implement mechanisms for improvement and there's structured project management and there's, you know, all sorts of process improvements, you know, ways to approach process improvement, I should say. But at the end of the day, as you'd mentioned, we're still all human beings and you can't ignore that. And one major factor of being humans and developing teams is trust and empathy and, and love you know, in a way in which you're, you're being genuine. Yep. But what great insight. And, you know, my third question, it, one of the mechanisms, I think, and I'm curious to get your thought on this, that you can create this love that you speak of in terms of leadership and effective management can be accomplished through this idea of storytelling, I think. And we know you may, you may be aware of the book, but there's a book called The Leader's Guide to Storytelling, Mastering the Art and Discipline of Business Narrative. And it was a book by, I believe it, it, the author's name is pronounced Stephen Denning. It's on my desk as we speak, but a, a good book. But you also mentioned on your site that one of your core principles to remember for leadership is that people need stories. Who are we? Why are we here? Where are we going? How will we get there? And you go on to state leaders can't bury the answers to these questions in strategy documents. They have to tell stories often. That's what makes people care. And in a sense, when you do that, you know, people care, but you're also developing this previous idea we were talking about with trust and, and, I, and love as well. But can you share more about this idea of storytelling and, and how it's used to accomplish effective leadership and team building? Sure. I think stories, stories have been the primary currency of human communication for, you know, thousands and thousands of years, you know, PowerPoint's been around for, uh, you know, a few, yeah, right. uh, you know, strategy <laughs> documents for a few. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a reason why companies like Amazon don't allow strategy, don't, don't allow slide decks anymore because they can't tell a story and, and what, what's, why, what's important in a story context. If I tell you about a decision that was made, that's good. That's interesting. If I'm an employee, I'm listening to a leader tell me about a, tell me about a decision was made. But, but, but maybe I disagree with that. And so I want to hear more about, well, how did you arrive at that decision? Tell me the backstory. Tell me a little bit about your values. Tell me a little bit about how you weighed the pros and cons of a few different ways, but how you chose you know, B over A and why you did that. And even if I would have chosen A over B, once I hear that, that helps me understand, all right, you know, I'm all aligned with that. I'll get on board with it. I see why you made it. I don't agree with it particularly, yeah. but, but I'm going to move forward with that. And, and that, I think, is so, so critical in helping people understand. I mean, this Amazon example is really interesting. I think I had this insight of probably about 15 years ago, and Amazon really took it and just doubled down on it. And what they do for, for the listeners who may not know, so slide decks are, are outlawed. You cannot bring a slide deck to any presentation at Amazon. You can only bring what they call a six-page memo, which is a narrative paragraph-based story about what you're doing. Go to a meeting, you sit down for 10 minutes, 15 minutes in the beginning, no one speaks, everyone reads the memo in its context and narrative form, and then the discussion starts, there's no presentation. Mm. It's a very practical example of using narrative-based stories to bring things to life. So whether you do it in a memo, whether you do it uh, in a presentation or, or you're speaking, the biggest, uh, I think, advantage is all, the, all that context that surrounds 
uh, surrounds decisions, which can only come out in my, in my experience with really good stories. So is it, um, do you think storytelling, effective storytelling and, and that whole art and discipline is really effective because is the bottom line because it gets down to the true nature of human communication? I think it does. And I think it allows for synthesis is what I think great stories yeah, do. Sure. There's, you know, as, as you walk in, I know a lot of people here, you know, uh, and your listeners are, are, are looking at really complex technology transformations, uh, implementations, mergers, you know, just some of the hardest stuff out there. The number of data points you're having to take into consideration when you're doing a change management project like that is just infinite. You can imagine a 75-page slide deck that just can't quite yeah. capture it. Yeah. But uh, but what a story does is synthes it can synthesize in a very understandable way all of those data points, highlighting some, de-accentuating others to really bring complexity to life in a way that a, a, a just a, an everyday human being can grasp and that that's i think why they've been stories have been so powerful throughout history yeah great insight so doug let's switch gears to your book my first question would be so what inspired you to write your book and for our listeners again that's taking smart risk how sharp leaders win when stakes are high what was your inspiration for that? Was it does it go back to you know your your root you know the story you explained in my first question as far as your experience and who is Doug? What, what inspired that? Yeah, there's a question and there's some history in the book and if you if you grab the book and read it you can see it. I won't go through all the history, but early in the early in my consulting and coaching career. I started asking this question of clients. A lot of time it was during values clarification work, which I often do early with clients or mm -hmm. individuals or teams. And the question is, tell me about a time in your life when you felt most alive. And I asked that individually uh, with clients. I would sometimes do team uh, workshops, sometimes do speeches, I would ask it. And, and after hearing answers for years and years and years, I start, there was a variety of themes that came out, but probably the clearest theme was I felt most alive when I was going out on a limb, when I was taking a risk, when I was pushing myself past whatever my current comfort zone was. And, you know, we often think about, when we think about risk taking in business, we think about what's going to help me achieve this thing, get this reward, whether that's financial or some sort of success. We often don't talk about the emotional value of risk taking, which is it connects me to something bigger. It connects me to an understanding of myself that I didn't have before. And I often argue that, you know, whatever we receive monetarily or um, uh, from an achievement perspective is kind of second prize compared to what we achieve by how we feel and how we've come alive. And as I listened to that, I realized there, there's, there's something here. And that was probably 16, 17 years ago. I started researching it. You know, I finished the book in 2013. But that's really what kicked me kicked me in the butt to kind of get this book down. I just thought it was so important. I'd heard this insight so many times from people. Yeah. I feel alive when I'm taking risks. Yeah. Interesting. You know, in, in your book, Doug, you discuss something that's really interesting. And, and frankly, I think it's a bit maybe undervalued in organizations. And that is you discuss how smart risk taking involves passion, to use your own words, passion, planning, active learning, communication, and the ability to embrace and reward the inevitable small failures along the way. Are you suggesting that we reward organizations for failure? And, and why? How, how is that possibly helpful? I would say yes. To, to a degree, that, that is what I'm suggesting. Um, but it's important to really distinguish what kind of failures. Um, and as, 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 you, as you mentioned, as the, as the book talks about a bit, um, smart failures. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I often say to people, we, we all know what a dumb failure is. You just kind of show up and, you know, don't have a great plan and you fumble, fumble along and you screw right. up. Um, we all know what a smart success is also, right? You planned mm -hmm. it out, you nailed it. Um, but we don't talk a lot about what a smart failure is. And what is a smart failure? A smart failure yeah. is something where you plan it out. You do the due diligence. You do the research. You get the feedback from people. It does look like, like a good idea. You go to execute. It doesn't work. And you walk away, hopefully, with an ability to harvest some really critical learning. And you're kind of raring to go again. You're ready to go again. At that point, you and your organizations has made a real investment and that investment's going to pay off hopefully in the next six months or 12 months or whenever. So why would you walk away at that point? So 
reward that person. What does that mean to reward them? Well, you know, maybe it doesn't mean monetarily rewarding them, but um, some stuff we we can we can talk about in some subsequent questions. You acknowledge it and you don't admonish it. Uh, and so it's uh, from that perspective, in some ways, it's it, it's rewarding uh, smart failures, well thought out failures. Yeah, that's good stuff, Doug. I really like that point, and I know you emphasize this in your book. And again, I I think at least from my experience and working with many organizations, this is an undervalued idea, or it's at least under executed idea. I would say. But yet fundamental. And, you know, I think when it comes to one thing is for certain, and that is an innovative and a creative organization and one that has an organizational culture based in organizational learning is a, a key influence to organizational success, right? Regardless of what the endeavor is. And this idea of smart failure and proper management, as you had just stated, of smart failure is a significant contributor to organizational learning and into creativity and innovation. Uh, but what a, um, you know, again, a, a powerful idea for sure. Well, I'll, I'll throw, Jack, one, there's one other point out there, which is I think it's one of the downsides of our quarter by quarter, you know, performance mentality. It, it's very hard to properly reward smart failures if you're just looking at the next quarter. I mean, I think it's it's one of the real challenges in this is the focus of this. A lot of people have thought and written about this topic, but it really incentivizes some of the wrong behaviors in organizations. And this is one of them. Yeah. And in fact, so let, let's um, maybe drill down a little bit more on this idea. You know, I know that you also state, and I, I do want to share this. Uh, I, I know I have a few quotes here, but sometimes it doesn't do justice to paraphrase. But you actually state on your site that, quote, most business leaders already know what needs to happen to drive innovation and entrepreneurship. People need to take chances and test new ideas. However, the frustration has always been, quote, how do you encourage people to take smart chances and teach them to be smart risk takers? I, I think this is so true. So smart risk taking can be easier said than done for, for many reasons. And, you know, the other reason is just driven by maybe the, the current business model where perhaps there's blinders on, you know, I, I should say, uh, the desired goals are more immediate goals, I would say, uh, to your point. Mm -hmm. um, but I know this is a large and a loaded question, Doug, but from a high level, what are some of the general tactics and practices to encourage this smart risk taking then? I would, I would throw out three of them. You, one is just quite simply define the difference between a smart failure and a dumb failure. Be really clear about it. And smart failure in our organization means you, you plan in this way, you brief in this way, you execute in this way, you're debriefing your projects in this way. You're going through the process that we've laid out. And then a dumb failure is you're, you're missing these things. You're, you're not putting the right thought in, the right check-ins in. You know, whatever it is, be clear about it in your organization. I would say that I seldom see organizations that are really crystal clear about what it means to smartly pursue something, fail or succeed. What does that really look like? Yeah. That's the first thing. The second thing is leaders role model it, whether that's um, merely saying as a leader, here's a big thing I'm going to go after. I'm going to follow that process. It worked or it didn't work. And really talk to your staff about it. Talk to your organization about it. If you've got, even if it's in, far in your past, if you've got a situation where you really went out on a limb in a smart way and failed, make sure your teams know about that. You know, talk yeah. about it in, in mm -hmm. meetings. And then the third thing I would say is what we've already been talking about, which, which is this idea of recognition, recognize this stuff publicly. There's a case study in the book, which um, is an innovation program. It's about a decade old now. I don't know if they still have it, but Tata, the big conglomerate out of India, had an inno innovation award. And they have four different types of innovation that started at the top from commercially successful. And then all, all the way at the bottom was the Dare to Try award. And the Dare to Try Award was a smart failure that didn't work. And mm -hmm. they would have a big meeting and they would fly people around the world back, back when we were doing that to attend this meeting. And they'd fly everyone, even the people who failed, and they would get them on stage and the CEO would reward them. That's a very public way of saying yeah. you will get acknowledged and rewarded. So finding public ways to do that, critical. Excellent tactical points and example. 
the reason I like to ask that question, and, and a lot of my questions I follow up with, you know, can you provide some general tactics and practices? Because I think that sometimes, even if maybe organizational leaders understand these ideas, and maybe it's more in theory or principle or concept, sometimes it's easier said than done to do the right things tactically to get you where you want to go. So uh, very, very interesting ideas there. The other point in your book, and I, I really like this, your book teaches how to act fast and learn fast and the value of a learning organization. I believe that for leaders to understand their own ability to create, reflect upon, and improve their ability to create a learning organization is paramount to success, right? So it goes back to the idea I just mentioned. It's, it's maybe not just good enough. You need to reflect and you need to improve, but you also need to do something tactically or practically to deliver upon your reflection. And in fact, your book teaches how to build learning into everything. Can you share more with our listeners and maybe some examples on that as well in terms of how you do that exactly? If, if I were to identify the biggest, quote unquote, missing thing, it's really smart postmortems, you know, dynamically, however often you need to, to do them. And, you know, they come, they, they're named by a lot of different things. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners will know some of these from postmortem, one of them. Uh, I think in, in Agile, it's called a retrospective, I believe. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the Army calls it an after action review. The Air Force calls it a debrief. It's generally the same thing. It's, it's going through a series of questions. And I often think of it as, you know, six core questions and lots of different people have different versions of it that they do. But the six core questions are just number one, what were we trying to accomplish? Let's be really clear. Here's what we were trying to hit. Number two, where did we hit our marks? Number three, where did we miss our marks? Number four, what could I have done better? Each individual room says, given that we didn't hit our marks, here's what I could have done better. Or we did hit our marks, but I think we could have done better. And then the fifth question, where can we improve as a team? So let's look at some real root cause stuff. Given all that, what should we start, stop, and continue doing? Nothing I said there is really rocket science. And anyone in this, uh, listen to this podcast who's been involved in, for example, digital transformations or large-scale uh, technology implementations will know these things. But actually doing them and doing well, it's what, I, it's what I call the knowing-doing gap. We know it, but yeah. a lot of times we don't do it as often or as effectively as we should. If you want to build a learning organization, I would say the number one tactic to really get that out of the gates is to put a process in place around this sort of postmortem uh, after action review stuff that actually works and that you stick with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, really, you know, you need to take advantage. You know, you, you need to learn from your smart failures and your smart successes, right? And, yeah. you know, back to this idea, if you want to create and improve a learning organization, First, that starts by reflection, and then and then the second step would be action, and that's that's exactly what you're saying. Like you said, it's maybe not rocket science, but I think that it seems to me like it's an area that most organizations would benefit from. You know, kind of thinking through how to do that exactly from a tactical perspective. In your book, and I think I, actually on your website, you state that you need to accept that you have to live with failure because it's an inevitable byproduct of taking risk, even smart risk, as you've described. And, and, but failing smart is the best way to learn. One way to do this, as you mentioned, is by creating a smart risk culture. Now, I know we kind of covered that a little bit on the previous couple of questions here, but high level, what can you provide or can you provide some pointers to create a smart risk culture in general? So, you know, the last couple of questions, Doug, you gave us some tactical points, you know, on how to reflect and how to kind of make that actionable. But just in general, to create that smart risk culture, what would you say are some of the keys to do that? Yeah, so I think the keys are, you know, a few of the things I've spoken about this idea of defining it, what a smart failure is, role modeling it, publicly recognizing mm -hmm. it. I think one of the things that when you think about if we step kind of out of this specific framework, we talk about leadership development, you know, there's, there's a model of leadership development out there, which says the best way to think about your trajectory, developing yourself as a leader, who are really the people who could create that smart risk culture or not, is to how am I leading myself, the team, and then the, and then the broader organization. And sometimes some of our leadership tactics or processes, they go right into leading of the team or organization. They're very process oriented. And sometimes 
the person who's doing that leading hasn't done a lot of personal reflection on what are their values? What are the things that they believe about human beings at their core that are driving their ways of interacting? Because we can, till we're blue in the face, talk about how important it is to reward and recognize smart failure. But if I'm a leader who does have that knee-jerk reaction and gives all sorts of bad signals for the first two or three days after the thing, whatever that failure was, happens, it's very hard to then pull back and hit all the right process points later. There's that momentary reaction and then response in that first 20 minutes after the disaster strikes or the problem happens that signals almost 90% of everything that's going to get signaled to a team. And if, if you're not doing the work yourself as a leader to really see the full board, see all the forces at play, understand yourself, understand people on your team and humanity in general, yeah. it's going to be very hard to just hit all those process points because to a large degree, accepting smart failures is a mindset before it's a set of practices. Hmm, that's great. I'm taking that quote, Doug. I'm going to borrow that quote. That's a good one. You know, that was such good insight. And you went exactly where I was hoping you would go with your response. And really, I, I think to summarize what you said, that is leadership tactics can be very process oriented and not so much based on personal reflection and on human interaction and just on reflection in terms of sending the right signals as well. You know, that idea is, in my view, every bit as important as, you know, process oriented improvement or leadership. Great, great idea. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, Doug, uh, really fun conversation so far. I, I know uh, we would love to have you back on. I think there's so much to talk about uh, in within your book, and I, I really highly recommend it. I think you touch on some key points that a lot of organizations just don't spend enough talking about, frankly. But I do want to conclude our time together today with, I think it's my favorite question, and I think it's Jonathan's favorite question as well. And the reason for that is because the podcast is really, you know, it's our primary objective just to share, you know, share information, what we call collective uh, collaboration and collective learning. As a fellow practitioner, you know, we do benefit from each other and from learning from our colleagues and our friends. And that's for both boots on the ground and maybe even researchers and academics. But how would you summarize this conversation in other words, if you had to distill your, your great work, your book, your experience into maybe three or four or five sentences, what piece of advice would you leave our listeners with? I'll, I'll actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go with words, five words. Okay. <laughs> I think, and, I, and, I'll give, and, and I'll give you just a little bit on each, but and, and some of them we've spoken about and one not much yet. And as I look back on my career doing this sort of work over the last 20 years, these are the themes that come up. We've spoken about one already, which is which is love. If you don't get that love point right, it, it means you're not understanding humanity. And that's a huge problem as a leader. The second one is courage. It obviously goes hand in hand with risk. Finding courage is, is when we find we're most alive. So critical. Third one won't be surprising, sweat. It just takes a lot of work and a lot of mistakes and a lot of uh, elbow grease uh, to get things done. The fourth one is humility, recognizing that no matter how much we know, we know close to nothing. And the more we think we know, the weaker 